I should be writing number 411. Hi there, welcome to I Should Be Writing, the podcast for wannabe fiction writers. I'm your host, Mer Lafferty, and yes, I am trying to podcast more regularly. It was embarrassing. Yesterday, um, I looked at the dates of the my most frequent podcast because I never, ever, ever remember what number the podcast is, so I have to look up the last one that I recorded. And I realized that I hadn't done one since May. And, uh, in my defense, I took July off, but I did not officially take June off. And so I'm sorry. And, uh, I thank those of you who stuck around and stayed subscribed. Because I got stuff to talk about. I still do. I woke up feeling, uh, jet, still jet lagged, but that means I woke up at 6.20 wide awake instead of 3.30. So that is a marked improvement. Um, so I thought, I started thinking about my new book and the structure kind of came together in my head. And so I was excited, so I went downstairs and made some coffee and went to start writing before I took my daughter to school. And I got about a thousand words. One thing that's very funny is one of the um, one of the POVs is from an AI. And to start out with, AI wants to talk a little bit in binary. And so I ran what I wanted to say through a binary converter. And now... I have a page full of ones and zeros. And the thing is, I've been writing for audio for so long that I almost hesitate to do this style because <laughs> I don't want to read a very, very, very long string of ones and zeros, and I don't want to require any other audiobook narrator to read a very, very long string of ones and zeros. I do know that, uh, I forget which book it was, but Douglas Coupland wrote a book that Will Wheaton I think, narrated, and the first part of the book was all numbers. I should probably look up the facts there because I can't remember what exactly the number was. It might have been pi, I'm not sure. But I know I picked up the book and saw the first page was just numbers. And you know, when you're reading, you can just go, oh, that's a lot of numbers. If I carefully sat down and tried to read all those numbers, I don't think I would get any more use out of the book. So I'm just going to, my brain is going to say, that's a lot of numbers, and I'm going to turn a page or two until I find some words. But for the audiobook, they read every single one. And I think it's kind of stupid that my, I slowed down. Like, I, I, I worried about whether I really wanted to uh, put all those ones and zeros in my book. But then again, if I'm the narrator, then I get to uh, decide whether that's going to be, quote unquote, a bunch of binary or 01000110. That's the first letter, by the way. I still haven't heard from Patreon about getting into my account, but I have heard from uh, the tour guide company that found my phone. So at the very worst, I'll probably, the phone will arrive and the authentication app will still be working. So I'll be able to log in with the two-factor authentication app, change the things I need to change, and then be into my account. And I heard that the new phone should be here Thursday or Friday. Or rather, my old phone. I have the new phone. I want to talk about a couple more things that happened at Worldcon. First, apologies to anybody listening who had to wait in my autograph line because there were uh, two buildings that encompassed Worldcon. And one was about a five to ten minute walk away from the other one. There was a train that ran between them, but not terribly often. I mean, for example... When I realized my realized my uh, uh, signing was in the other building, I started running there because, frankly, this is embarrassing, but it's the truth. We don't have uh, trains or any sort of subway system in Durham, North Carolina. And I figured puzzling through how to buy a train ticket and figuring out, do I buy one for the day? Do I buy one for one ride? That was just not something I wanted to think about because I was panicked because I was late for my signing. So, um, so I ran, and in the time that I ran, no train ever passed me, so I know I didn't waste time by running and not taking the train. But 
it's making me think, um, I used to think of Worldcon bids in the terms of, is this a city or country that I want to visit? And not necessarily, are the hotels close by? Do they have a freaking, another building that's considerable walk or train ride away? And I mean considerable, like, if you have accessibility issues, it's, it's a much bigger thing to think. I have to go all the way down the street to this other building. And I mean, that's a long street. And, um, other things like how big is the auditorium they're going to hold the Hugos in? Because this year you had to have tickets to the Hugos, which my family and I ran into a couple of problems with, but we dealt with it and everybody got to go. Um, but they had tickets because you don't have to pay for them, but you needed to pick one up because they didn't have enough seats for everybody who wanted to see the Hugos. And so I'm realizing when I look at bids, I don't want to think, you know, would I rather go to Washington, D.C. or New Orleans? I think, where are the hotels? What buildings are going to make the con? Where's the Hugos? Uh, where are the Hugos going to be held? Little things like that. And I gotta say that Kansas City was not a place that I was eager to go. But it was all in the convention center. And the, the convention center is surrounded by hotels. So when it actually came to the prospect of going to the con and being at the con, I, it was easy. It was great. Kansas City did a great job. Spokane, not so much, because I had a very, I had a far, far, uh, hotel, and they didn't really have taxis to speak of, so I either had to walk or figure out the bus schedule. It's, it's become an issue. And I guess I've been to enough world cons right now where suddenly I'm thinking about these things. You, you don't just assume that it's going to work out, that, that all of that seamless stuff is easy. And I know people work very hard. You know, throwing a con is like sound editing. When it's done right, you don't notice it. And when it's done poorly, then everybody notices. So I just realized I started talking about this because I was apologizing to anybody who waited in line while I was running to my signing. Um, I didn't get a reading this year, which was okay. I don't have anything coming up, but I hate readings. Anyway, because I've had too many guys interrupt them to tell me how I'm wrong or give suggestions or perhaps start a workshop. And yes, this has happened more than once. I had a guy, um, I was reading from a book I was hoping to sell and another book that I had sold one time. And I mentioned that uh, the non-sci-fi one had not sold, but the sci-fi one did have a publisher. And he's like, he was surprised. He couldn't believe it. That sci-fi one was Six Wakes, which, you know, was nominated for a couple of things. Today is the day that New York Times guy, who's all for people being made uncomfortable by problematic speech, and free speech on campus is the most important thing in the world, and no one should ever lose their job for something they say, he freaked out over someone calling him a bed bug. And wrote the guy and CC'd his boss. So clearly he wanted the guy fired for calling him a bed bug. And now people of color and women on Twitter are just going, are you kidding me? You're getting upset about bed... You would not last a minute being a woman or a person of color on Twitter. And now the guy is sad and he's left Twitter. Boo-hoo. I gotta say, stuff like this just makes me want to move away from social media. I, I've been spending too like I haven't been on Twitter much and I got spent too much time on Twitter this morning. I, I'm I'm having trouble balancing my life. And other people are saying, you know, people are moving away from Twitter and going to Instagram and uh booktubing on YouTube and the booktube movement is great, except that makes me think I need to wor worry about my lighting and whether I've had a shower or not. So because it's on my mind I want to talk about one other thing. And that is film options, because uh, 
I don't think a lot of people know how they work. Because a lot of people want to say, hey, who would you pick to play characters in your book? Uh, and I know sometimes that's just a uh, fun experience. That, that's, that's just like a party discussion topic. How options work is first uh, somebody makes a an offer on your work. You hope more than one person does, but they and what they're buying is the option to maybe make a movie or a TV show. If this happens to you and you don't have an agent, you should get one or contact a writer you know. And if you don't know any writers and you're still getting movie queries, contact me. Because a lot of people want to give next to nothing for options. Because the world is kind of a nasty place sometimes, some people buy options because they don't want their competitors to make the movie. Not that they ever have any intention to make it. But I try to look at it as, um, for writers, it's free money. If you find things important, such as if you have characters from marginalized backgrounds and you want to make sure they remain from marginalized backgrounds, then you need to put that in your contract. You can't trust anybody if they say, oh yeah, sure, we'll do that. I know somebody who walked from a deal because there was a, uh, there was a plan to change the race of one of the characters. You know, it's free money. Actually, no, it's not free money. It feels like it's free money, but it's not free money because you are you're not doing work, but you're giving something up because once you move from a book to a, a dramatic presentation, to use the Hugo form, you're going from, you know, you and a handful of editors, you know, cleaning up behind you, but you create everything to a large group of people creating everything. You know, there's going to be someone in charge of casting. There's going to be someone in charge of editing. There's going to be someone in charge of effects. There's going to be someone else in charge. And if you have a vision for any of this, there's no guarantee that any of that will be followed. And so you have to ask how much you're willing to give up. Ursula K. Le Guin um, was sick and tired of people buying the rights to her Earthsea series and then not making the main character have brown skin or other issues. But if you have something that matters to you very strongly, then you need to put that in your contract or be prepared to walk or do what some people say. I believe it was Max Brooks with World War Z, I think, which is just take the money and walk away. I don't think he ever saw World War Z. And from what I heard of the movie, it had very little to do with the book, which makes me wonder why did they pay him money? Why didn't you just make a zombie movie? Maybe they were trying to cash in on the title World War Z. I don't know. World War Z was a brilliant book and it didn't look like a brilliant movie. But anyway, I digress. I can only, I can only tell you how it works from my experience. Because if, if things get into the actual show being created or movie being created, I don't know because I haven't experienced that. But they buy your option rights for a certain amount of time. And my experience has been 18 months. And then at the end of those 18 months, either those rights revert to you, or they have to pay for them again. Um, if they get to the point of another step in the production process, they... Um, will pay you another bit of money. And they'll usually have it set up to where if it, uh, if they actually end up making a movie, you'll make this much. If they end up making a TV show and it's on one of the major networks, you'll get this much. Or if it's on one of the minor networks or streaming, you'll get this much per episode. So they, they work all that out. But you really do want someone to look at it. Look at your contract. And I'm not offering to, to when I said, I just want you to tell me if someone's like offering you a thousand dollars for your book. Cause that's not, that's not enough for a movie option. That's awful.
the thing that's hardest to tell people is when you do, when, if, if word does get out that you did sell an option, they think, A, you'll have something to do with it, and B, it's coming out next year. When it very likely won't come out. I'm pretty sure we've never seen a John Scalzi movie. I'm also pretty sure that he's sold the movie rights on every one of his books at one time or another. So it's, uh, that's why it's free money in that someone gives you money and nothing really happens. If it does happen, then you know that what you've done is if you've given up some of your rights. But a movie made of your book, whether you like it or not, will probably boost sales. And that's really awesome. But if you have any questions about movie options that I might be able to answer, free feel, to, feel free to email me at mightymertgmail.com. Or ask me on Twitter, which I seem to be on a lot today, at Mighty Mer. And if you just want to look at my site, uh, it's merverse.com. Still can't get into Patreon, as I said earlier. Let's hope I hear from support soon, or hope that my other phone gets here so I'll have my authentication app. Two-factor authentication, it's good for security until it locks you out of your thing, so... If you have two-factor authentication, and I think you should, and somebody gives you an option to have recovery codes in addition to either texting you or using an app, write those down. Because if you lose your phone, then you can't even get into these, uh, you can't even log into these sites on your computer. Trust me, I know. And so I can't log into Patreon and give you guys any exclusive stuff right now, but... <laughs> If you'd like to uh, support me, or support the Patreon, or get or check out the uh, I Should Be Writing archives, or check out our Discord chats uh, site, then that's patreon.com slash mightymer. And word count on the six-week sequel stands at 1,096 words. Because I have been writing! And so should you be. Remember, you can support the show at patreon.com slash mightymer. I should be writing theme music provided by John Emilio. You can find more about him at johnemilio.com. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution share-alike license. The fact that's on to is on to me.